Like her five million compatriots, Tina Saltveld won the lottery when she was born Norwegian. You don't have to travel very far to get out in the nature. You can just go on the tram and it takes you 10 minutes and you're out in the forest. Or you can go for a run or in the winter time you go skiing. So, and you're even close to the sea, so you can go swimming. And Norway is not just beautiful, it's filthy rich. It has been voted as the best country to live in in the world because the uh, living standard is very high. And of course the reason why we have this high living standard is of course the oil. I was born the year we started to produce oil in, in Norway. And of course I'm part of the oil generation here in Norway where we have seen that the fortune has been increasing, the living standard has been increasing. We got a lot from the state, school, university. We have, high, we have the high education here. We don't even have to pay to go to the dentist. When Tina Saltvert isn't jogging through the forest, she's chief oil analyst with an investment bank. We've been lucky, but I'm not sure that the coming generations will be that lucky. Because Norway now faces the challenge of all resource economies, falling prices and rising emissions. So it's vowing to lead the world in going green. The state oil company Statoil is even pushing for a global carbon tax. A carbon tax is a very important thing. It's a very important instrument to fuel a transformation and provide incentives to minimize CO2 emissions. It might sound strange that an oil and gas company that kind of produce carbon is advocating, please put a tax on carbon, but that's actually what we're doing. Norway certainly has the money to pay for change. Unlike many resource-rich countries, it didn't squander its wealth. It put the profits into a national piggy bank called the Sovereign Wealth Fund. The fund was set up in the 90s by some far-sighted civil servants led by Martin Skanke. It's now the world's biggest. It's like having an endowment where you spend the returns every year, but you leave the capital intact. So what is that capital now? It's uh, about $900 billion. Uh, $900 billion? Yes. So US, yeah. that's about $170,000 per person? Yes. Yeah. That's a lot of money. <laughs> so it's a lot of money. So it's, uh, it's maybe two times our GDP. And Norway has shown how quickly it can transform its economy. You just have to visit the oil capital Stavanger to see that. Just a generation ago, this was just a sleepy fishing town. But after the first offshore oil fields were found in 1969, Stavanger very quickly became Norway's Saudi Arabia. In fact, the money flowed in so thick and fast, Norwegians started calling it the Olje Eventira, the oil fairy tale. The question now, of course, is will it have a happy ending? For many people, life in Stavanger really has been idyllic. People that live in this region feel that the economy is strong and uh, I think uh, they have uh, the opportunity to make dreams come true. Carla Ringsby and his wife Kristen work for the Oil Industry Association. They have three small children, born under the generous maternity entitlements of Norway's oil-funded welfare state. I can stay home for, I think it's, is it 49 weeks? Uh, and still get paid for work. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. What about the fathers? Do you get time off too? Yeah. yeah. But these days they don't just think about their children's future, they worry about the planet. Of course, uh, in our job the, it's, uh, it's a discussion and, and um, people talk about it. 
but I, I think the uh, the no Norwegian oil and gas industry are good about to think about the environment. They are trying to invest in the environment, and and I'm uh, I'm pretty comfortable that we will find a solution together because that's Norwegian strength. Uh, they are finding a solution together. At last year's Paris Climate Change Conference, Norway agreed to aim for carbon neutrality by 2050. In June, Parliament voted to move the target forward to 2030. Norway already has a carbon tax of around $50 a tonne. The Conservative government says it's working well. It's good for financing the welfare state and it's good for really giving the industry a strong incentive to reduce CO2 emissions. In most countries, electric cars are an expensive statement for cashed up greenies. Here, massive subsidies make them the cheapest cars to buy or hire. I've just been to the main hire company and the electric cars are less than half the price of diesel cars. And because the small model I wanted wasn't available, I've been given a free upgrade to a Tesla S90D. So this Tesla I'm driving is the cheapest hire car in Oslo. Only in Norway. Oh, and you don't have to bring back a full tank. Or any tank. Norway exempts electric cars from the crippling import and registration taxes that petrol guzzlers have to pay. You even get unlimited free parking at city metres and you just plug in a cable to charge for free. Perks like that have made Little Norway the biggest market for Teslas after the US. And all the electricity comes from water. Our very important and very efficient uh, hydropower facilities do supply 96% of our total uh, consumption. And on top of that we also have some very good wind resources that increasingly are uh, developed at the moment. There's just one small problem. While Norway's subsidising electric cars and building bike lanes across the land, it's continuing to mine oil and gas at sea. In May, the government granted 13 companies exploration licences in the South Barents Sea along the Russian border. That will potentially open vast new fields of oil and gas on the edge of the high Arctic. Oil and gas fields uh, do tend to, to deplete and to be able to maintain our position as a uh, supplier of uh, energy resources uh, to a global population that demands uh, increasingly more energy. Uh, we do have to continue exploring uh, new acreage. And that has Greens seen red. I think it's absolutely uh, undeserved to call Norway a leader on climate policy. We have exported oil and become rich on exported oil, which has, when it's been burned all over the world, uh, uh, contributed something like 14 billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere. And on top of that, we're continuing to uh, explore new oil. So that's what Norway is really doing. And that is the great paradox of Norway, a country that prides itself on green measures at home, but pays for them by selling fossil fuels abroad. It's an odd look for a country on the front line of climate change. Norway prides itself on being a polar nation. And the next place we're heading is where the change is happening fastest. A place where no one stays a global warming sceptic for long. This is the very edge of Norway, the Svalbard archipelago high in the Arctic. 
It's as far north as any country has settled, and even boasts the world's most northerly town, Longyearbyen, just 1,300 kilometres from the North Pole. It began life as a coal mining settlement, but as the coal ran out, it reinvented itself as a base of Arctic tourism. Even at the height of summer, it's a chilly place, though not nearly as cold as it used to be. I first came to Svalbard 17 years ago, and I have to say it's extraordinary how much things have changed. Back then, in April 1999, Svalbard wasn't just frozen, the sea was too. Before the annual summer melt, you could ride snowmobiles right across the archipelago, dodging the odd polar bear as you scooted across the fjords. We rode 10 kilometres over the frozen Arctic Ocean to an iceberg. Lovely animals, these polar bears. Our guide then was Jason Roberts, an Australian adventurer who'd moved to Svalbard to be an Arctic cinematographer. Jason Roberts is still here. The ice often isn't. Since you visited last time, the climate has changed drastically. The oceans have become much warmer. And the open water and not frozen ocean in summer is not new to climate change. That's historical. That's normal. What we've seen in the recent years is no sea ice or very little sea ice in the inner fjords in the winter, and that's due to climate change. Last winter, for the first time anyone could remember, the water didn't freeze at all. This winter was impossible to do what we did 17 years ago. The ocean was nearly not frozen anywhere on the west coast of Svalbard. The completely open water up to the beach line, which we'd never experienced before. We experienced low sea ice years, but this was no sea ice year, I call it. So you could really see the change which affects us living here, you know. As I said, you know, we love it when the ocean's frozen. It's our highway to get out of town. We're heading out to see for ourselves. Our destination is one of Svalbard's fastest retreating glaciers, Nordenskjöld. Even on a calm summer's day, you need to take survival gear. Arctic weather is unpredictable and can turn dangerous in an instant. Our guide, Tom Foreman, is armed and we soon see why. This hungry polar bear has been roaming the glacier in search of food. Norden's cold looks enormous as we approach, but it's not as giant as it used to be. Uh, it's gone back about five kilometres uh, since the 50s or 60s. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, previously, uh, the island ahead of us, um, that was completely covered, and uh, the island was first became visible uh, somewhere around 2000. All right. So when I was here 17 years ago, this we would have been in the glacier. It was. It was about two kilometres further out than it is now. It's incredible. And that island has just appeared out of nowhere as the glacier has gone back. It has. The uh, glacier you can see now here is back on its grounding line. So it's uh, the base of the front of the glacier is all uh, standing on rock rather than floating on the open ocean. We soon see the awesome might of the natural forces at work here as giant chunks of ice carve into the fjord. We have to stay back hundreds of metres to avoid being swamped by the waves. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, ex absolutely spectacular when it comes down. compared to some. It's, uh, yeah, when you see those 
blocks that are the size of skyscrapers coming down. And it's, uh, it's awe-inspiring. It's kind of hard to believe that we're having such a heavy impact on things that are just this big. There's such immense fields of ice, and so much erosive power as well. If you go over there, there's actually a meltwater uh, tunnel and a meltwater river coming out. That's why it's all, it's all such dirty brown um, water. Sediment being washed out. Yeah. Even more striking is behind the face of the glacier, where the ice has thinned dramatically. Glaciers do advance and retreat naturally, but it's the speed of the change that's alarming. So glaciers thin, glaciers grow, they get longer, they get shorter. I mean, the ocean has been hotter in the past than it is at the moment. There's been times that in the past in the Earth's history that there's been no ice at all. But the times, the scales that this stuff changed over was geological time scales. And species and animals had time to actually evolve and catch up and, or die off in a natural way. The, the changes that are happening now, I think, on, on this planet are on a scale or a time... The time scale that it's happening over is mass extinction time scales. Really fast. Too fast for species to keep up. Svalbard has become emblematic of the changing climate. But the government says it has no plans to mine for oil this far north. The South Barents Sea has far less ice. Ice will mean some operational challenges. Uh, but of course, they will not, the companies will not be allowed to conduct any industrial scale activities in the region if they can't prove that they are prepared uh, for all uh, kinds of operational challenges they could meet in the region. But many who work across the Arctic believe oil mining anywhere in the region is inherently unsafe. Even the Barents Sea experiences months of total darkness. Freezing weather compounds the dangers of oil spills. Any sort of oil exploration in the Arctic, I feel, is uh, irresponsible. It's, um, it's a very, very high-risk area to do it, and everything about it is more difficult. Tom Foreman gained a Master's in Environmental Sustainability before coming to work in Arctic logistics and risk assessment. Um, if there's any spills, if there's any uh, difficulties, if there's any uh, breaks of equipment, everything is more difficult, everything takes more time. Um, and at the same time, um, it's so much harder to clean up uh, because it's colder. Uh, and also the uh, ecosystems are so much more sensitive up here. The infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, there's so much oil infrastructure there already uh, designed for cleaning it up and it still took weeks for them to get deep water horizon. But here things could go wrong. <laughs> here things can go very wrong up here. Um, the number of uh, predictable elements up here are fewer. Uh, there's very much more that you can't control, that you wouldn't even imagine could go wrong uh, in an environment like this. The first place Norway looked for oil was actually up here in Svalbard. Now, it was never exploited and for decades the high Arctic has been exempt from mining. But as the sea ice thins and the pack ice retreats, it's quite possible Norway will extend its oil drilling areas even further north. The government insists the age of oil isn't ending anytime soon. But the age of coal is, at least for Norway. Just as falling prices have closed most of Svalbard's mines, Norway's wealth fund has sold all its coal investments. For coal, I think it's obvious that the best strategy is to get out of coal as soon as possible. But you see a time where the Norwegian Sovereign Fund won't be investing in oil. Well, I see a time when uh, oil companies will not exist, right? because at some point we cannot produce more oil. We cannot produce fossil uh, 
fuels at all because unless we find uh, effective and efficient technologies to extract CO2 um, uh, emissions. The industry insists it's doing just that. Statoil hasn't just lavished money on its headquarters, it's invested heavily in carbon capture, a process of removing carbon dioxide before it pollutes the atmosphere. What we're doing there is that we take CO2, uh, capture it at the uh, facility and we deposit it uh, underneath in uh, kilometres deep uh, depleted um, oil and gas reservoirs and store it permanently. So over the last years we have stored a total of nearly 15 million tonnes of CO2. But so far the process captures just 9% of CO2. So to meet its targets, Norway is buying carbon credits from the EU. That means it's paying other countries to pollute less, so it can keep polluting more. I'm deeply embarrassed, um, and I think most uh, sensible Norwegians should be fairly embarrassed, because, frankly speaking, the idea about Norway being such a great contributor to uh, solving the climate uh, change issue is a scam. Uh, we aren't. We are contributing to the problem much, much, much more than we are contributing to the solution. But in a world that still needs oil, Norway says it's doing it best. Been able to produce the, the, the lowest CO2 per barrel produced nearly in the world. You might call us petroholics, but at least we're trying to be responsible petroholics then. Like his government, Carla hopes the oil continues to flow for generations. I would definitely recommend my kids to work in the industry. But even here, the fairy tale seems to be ending. Global oil prices have halved since 2014. While Norway's wealth fund has cushioned the blow, Stavanger has been feeling the winds of change. Uh, the biggest change is that uh, some neighbours have lost the job and in the family uh, people have lost the job. Um, and I think uh, everyone is concerned about uh, the situation uh, in the industry and for the country. But in, in Norway, I think they have uh, invested in a good way in funds and, uh, and in the future. So I think the, uh, the country in itself will stand strong, even if this will continue a little bit more. Optimists hope prices will recover. Tina Saltvet fears Norway's easy run is over. She wonders if there will even be a profit from the new Arctic oil. I'm not sure about that. I think that's a question which is important to ask because I think that you know the change or the uh, switch to other energy sources, especially in the transportation sector, will have a big impact on the oil market. And I think that will go much faster than the oil companies are, are predicting today. So I'm not sure if it's actually going to be profitable in the next 20, 30 years. So we might actually be investing in something which is not giving us the opportunities we hope in the future. Summer is now over in Oslo. People are looking forward to the ski season, though in recent years it's grown much shorter and wetter. The government is proudly pressing on with plans to cut emissions while exporting the fuels that cause them. The end of this fairy tale is still to be written. Yeah.